Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to today's uh, webinar on the uh, per Puerto Rico uh, Petri Unit Showcase. I'm happy to announce that we have a very distinguished guest, in addition to uh, Fermin uh, Fontanes, who is our uh, special guest speaker. We also have here uh, John Christopher Bart. He is the executive director of the World Association of Petri Units and Professionals, and happy to have him here and say a few words. Uh, so JC, if you can kind enough say a few words of what's WAP and why are we here and what we intend to do. JC. Buen dia y bienvenida a este webinar uh, de la región de las Américas de WAP, la Asociación Mundial de los AP, las Unidades APP, los profesionales de los APP. Welcome to the uh, Americas initiative of organizing this webinar with uh, for the first time, the PPP unit of Puerto Rico. We're very pleased to host you today uh, for this opportunity to talk about your projects and your plans. Uh, we were hoping to see you a bit earlier this year during the annual Congress. And due to technical glitches, uh, we're now finally able to do this and we're very much looking forward to that. So thank you very much, uh, Senor Fontanes. Um, thank you. For, thank for you for sharing. Thank you for for, for sharing uh, a bit of uh, time and of, of uh, hopefully giving us, uh, you know, reboosting our uh, interest for this part of the world, also what is happening in terms of P3. And uh, I wish you a beautiful you. webinar. And thank you so much for Oscar Cortez uh, for moderating this with Brio as always. Uh, muchísimas gracias, mi amigo en México. Y estamos muy contentos de uh, tenerte en el liderazgo de, de, de las Américas en Guapa. Muchas gracias. Gracias, amigo. Gracias, amigo JC. Sé que tienes otro compromiso. I know you have another big event to attend. So thank you so much for that kind words. And, and yes, WAP is a big family. We really encourage uh, everybody to sign up. I think it's a great opportunity to have a, uh, in every, this is a very horizontal organization. That's why I liked it. Everybody participates and, and, the, and within your limitations of time, but you can dive in and be part of leaderships. It, it is very outstanding. And we have a good network of international distribution. And, and, and we have right now 25, uh, P3 units, and uh, I'm happy to announce that Puerto Rico will be the number 26. He will be uh, coming in on board as the next P3 unit for the WAP family. And our goal is to have 50 by the end of the year. That's our goal. And and, and maybe okay. hopefully next year, our Congress will be in person. This year was online. It was very successful. But that's what WAP is. We have a strong membership. And with that, I do want to introduce uh, the uh, North American Leadership Committee, uh, which I'm part of. I have here uh, uh, a couple of members who are very distinguished and they're always um, uh, outstanding in their work. I, I want to introduce the first Larry Thanos. She is a lawyer by, by trade. She's part of the Leadership Committee. She specializes in, in binational projects. She's currently based in the um, in Windsor and Detroit area. So but she travels a lot and she's, I'm happy to announce her. She's part of this great team. So Lori, thank you for being there. I also want to introduce Mr. Wayne Collins. He's uh, also in Canada. He, uh, special thanks to Wayne. He really helped us uh, setting up all the logistics for this event. Uh, I do want to give him uh, props that uh, without him, we really couldn't do anything, you know? So thank you, Wayne, for that. He is, he has a Great specialized uh, company that uh, deals with operations and maintenance of Petri projects. Very interesting. And, you know, and also I want to give a shout out and uh, to David Baxter. Yeah, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, fortunately for him, he's on vacation, <laughs> but he conveys a, a message of uh, saying hi to you. He's uh, Mr. David Baxter, as you know, he's a well-recognized P3 uh, specialist. So he's part of the, uh, uh, also the North American committee, the leadership. But uh, like uh, JC mentioned, this is uh, America. So we also have uh, the South American leadership and uh, happy to announce Alejandro Perez is one of them. I see he's coming, is, is here in the audience. And we have also Jaime Lee, 
is part, part of that uh, leadership committee. And uh, <clears throat> Alejandra, I uh, forgot her last name. I apologize for that. Alejandra, she's also um, uh, part of that leadership committee in the South America. And uh, Alejandra Jaramillo, sorry about that. But also we have uh, another special uh, friend of mine, David Alvarez. He is uh, very much a Puerto Rican and involved with uh, a lot. Uh, shout out for him. He's a good friend. And uh, with that, I want to really uh, uh, talk a little bit about the background. Why Puerto Rico? Where, what's important? Uh, uh, es tan importante esta reunión? You know, I'll be uh, talking both in uh, mainly in English, but sometimes in Spanish for our Spanish speaking people. So I'll give a little background of what, what we want to showcase Puerto Rico. Obviously, with the good news, is they're part of our P3 family unit. What? What, uh, what's important for Puerto Rico. And then I'll give you a little bit of the ground rules for the Q&A, it will be both English and Spanish, that's not a problem. Uh, I'll read uh, the bio for Fermin, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give him the, uh, the floor. So with that, why Puerto Rico? You know, Puerto Rico <clears throat> had a very uh, devastating, hurricane in 2017, uh, I believe it's uh, Hurricane Marla. It really damaged the infrastructure and the economic well-being of the island on the tune of close to $100 billion. So uh, it, it destroyed uh, 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 most of the power grid and all the communication and affected 3.5 million people who live in the island. So I think that's the, the historical background. This is four years ago. What what happened there that really put the, uh, isolated the island for many things. And one of the things we're, they're looking at is how you build up the infrastructure back and make it resilient. I think that's a concept that it's important to have resilient infrastructure. But in addition to that, one of the concepts that we're using WAP is putting people first, making things uh, uh, from a, uh, economically feasible, but also socially feasible. I think it's important to give that opportunity to have people first as part of the strategy, as part of the methodology to analyze P3 units and P3 efforts. So the Puerto Rico Public uh, Partnership Authority is spearheading the transfer of much needed investments from Puerto Rico, looking to transforming the economic by securing private capital for public projects, they're building a robust, uh, resilient infrastructure that uh, to, exec to execute strategic commercial efforts to meticulously choose pro projects, and, and Fermin's going to talk about that they are going to really uh, bring back the economy and the well being of all the citizens there. Uh, and for that, he has launched a, a lot of opportunities, a pipeline of projects. There's currently projects ongoing. You know, to say the least, the transformation of the Puerto Rico electrical power one is when it comes into mind authority. Uh, and then the modernization of the digital infrastructure, among others, in the airport. So I won't dive in. I'll let that to Fermin, that he's going to talk about that. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guests today. Uh, Mr. Fermín Fontanés, he's a lawyer by trade. Um, el licenciado Fermín Fontanés es abogado. Uh, he is the executive director of the Puerto Rico Partnership Authority. Uh, Fermín Fontanés currently serves executive director of the Puerto Rico Private Partnership Authority. He is responsible for leading and managing the public partnership transactions for the transformation of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, including the awarded P3 uh, project for the operations and maintenance agreement for the electrical transmission and distribution system. Very important <laughs> to have that, that, like I said, the electrical grid basically disappeared during that hurricane. Um, Fonsonés is also in charge of several innovative infrastructure projects such as the awarded P3 for the concession of the transportation service of the Marine Transportation Authority. Another one that's very important, obviously being an island. Fultanes has, uh, holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Policy and Resource Behavior from the University of Michigan. Hey, Lori, she's from, he's from Michigan, thank you. 
and a Juris Doctor degree from George Washington University. Very outstanding. He has more than 15 years experience in environmental law at the federal, local, and uh, areas in the areas of energy, land use, uh, law, including corporate transactions, permitting, regulatory compliance, and environmental litigation. Prior to becoming executive director of the P3 unit, Fontanez was part of the environmental law, energy, and land use practice group, and two leading legal firms in Puerto Rico. Before practicing environmental law, he was founder and president of the Environmental Consultant Service Company for projects through the United States, Central and South America, among which are the Bolivia, Brazil pipeline, the Puerto Rico trans transshipment port, and the waste to energy facilities. As you can see, he has a very extensive uh, curriculum, and we're very happy to have you, Fermín. Estamos encantados de tenerte aquí con nosotros. Creo que eh, Puerto Rico es va a ser extraordinario su contribución. Pues con eso te cedo la palabra. The floor is yours. Oh, before that, let me give you the ground rules. Uh, there is a little uh, Q&A um, at the bottom of the box. If you can kind enough to put your, doesn't matter if it's in Spanish, even in Arabic. We have Laurie speaks very fluent Arabic. So for those who are looking in uh, for the other parts of the world, please put your question there. I really encourage, I think uh, that's the beauty of this. We want a dynamic conversation. And uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So it's gonna have a life after this. So with that, I'll let Mr. Fermi Fontana state the floor. Thank you, Fermi. Gracias, gracias, Oscar, and thank you, everybody, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to, to join today. I know that we had um, some technical issues before, but I'm really glad that, that I had the opportunity to, to speak with all of you today and, and give you uh, uh, an introduction and a summary of what we're doing in Puerto Rico and what we're trying to do. So, muchas gracias a todos los que están aquí con nosotros el día de hoy. Gracias por la invitación. Esperemos que les guste nuestra presentación. Voy a estar hablando un poco de lo que hemos, hemos hecho hasta ahora, lo que vamos a hacer y hablarles un poco de, de, ¿verdad? de nuestra oficina, nuestra práctica y los proyectos que tenemos. So with that, I'm going to share our presentation on screen for everybody so, to see. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go today, as I mentioned before, I'll give you an overview of the public par private partnership authority, what we are, what we have been doing on our process. Then I'll talk about the most recent P3s that we have closed. Then I'll go, I'll give you a summary of the ongoing procurements that, that we have going on right now. And then finally talk about the new projects that we're embarking on and future P3 opportunities before we go over to, uh, to the Q&A. And I know that um, Oscar mentioned that we have David Alvarez, David Alvarez, no, it's not only our friend and colleague, he's also the first executive director of the P3 Authority and the one that led this program to, to where we are today. So kudos to David and always thanking him for his support of our program and what we are doing. So Puerto Rico is, is one of the few US jurisdictions that, ha, that really has a robust and comprehensive PPP program and framework. Um, when, when, and, and when this first began or the idea of, of bringing this into fruition and, and establishing the Enabling Act and the, and the office, we looked at, at the World Bank as our guideline to try to establish a program that was gonna get the credibility and, and really the framework to lead processes that will end up in in good projects and that we will raise the interest in the market of what we were doing so looking at uh, at those guidelines we we looked for five key components we wanted to have a clear public policy of what we wanted to do a strong legal framework which is act 29 of 2009 and the regulations that were adopted 
based on, on that framework, clear processes and institutional responsibility, and a responsible financial management, and the good, good governance arrangement. So by providing that clarity and uniformity with respect to the process and the selection process of, of the partners and the procurement process, the, the P3 Act really represents one of the most robust legal frameworks out there for, for P3 projects. It, it has been recognized as such, and other jurisdictions have actually mimicked our, our what we have done in trying to establish it, their own processes. So with this, I know that most of you already know all of this, but this is a project delivery method that is really not a privatization. It's a partnership between the government of Puerto Rico and the partnering entities and the private parties. As you will see as I go forward with our presentation, we, we do have the different models um, of PPPs in, in either on the ones that we have established so far, but also on, on the ones that are in process. So we have gone from everything to an O&M to, to a design build financial operations and maintenance type of agreement. And, and that is really what we're looking for. We're looking for, for projects that, that serve the government of Puerto Rico and the partnering entity, but uh, that are also viable to the market and the people that are, are looking to partner with the government of Puerto Rico. And every project, uh, as we always say, all, all, all P3s are different. Everyone address, every project addresses different issues. So, eso es lo que estamos buscando, buscar proyectos que atiendan específicamente los asuntos que la entidad participante necesita mejorar y nosotros como en gobierno, ya sea asuntos de infraestructura, servicio a la ciudadanía y mejoras que, que, ¿verdad? que tenemos que hacer. So, I, I want to add something else to what Oscar said in the beginning. Not only did we suffer two hurricanes in, in 2018, but we also were going through a financial crisis or, and we're still you know, working our, our, our way out of that financial crisis. So in, in 2017, no, knowing the fiscal situation that the government of Puerto Rico was facing and the need for for investment, foreign investment, and, and improvement in infrastructure and services, the government decided that the, the P3 platform really needed to, to essentially step up to try to look for solutions in the private market to help us address the, those, those critical issues. So since 2017, we have been moving or progressing the P3 program in Puerto Rico to try to address different scenarios. And you will see that as we go along. But, you know, the fundamentals of our program, which is, are essential for P3s, is that, as Oscar mentioned before, we needed private investment in infrastructure, but we also, because the government could not afford it, but also, it was also a time of, I would say, self-reflection as government, where we realized that there were some essential services that we were not handling in the way that, that the, cit the citizens of Puerto Rico deserved. And we had tried to, to restructure some of them and had really not, not failed. So it was really a, a self-reflection moment, I would say, for, for the government of Puerto Rico to decide we, we need to step up and we need to look for somebody that, to help us. So not only investment in infrastructure, but also bringing partners with experience on different areas that would help us take those services to where we wanted, to, wanted them to be. So in, in all our structure, the government of Puerto Rico remains the owner of, of the property and the title. We, we have a really transparent process, procurement process, not only for, for the citizens, but re really importantly for all the participants, everybody, uh, all, the, all the parties that participate have the same access to all the information. They have the same access to the 
partnering entity to questions, information, due diligence, site visits, and we and we try to to maintain that competitive tension between all the participants and providing them with as much information as we can to try to to have a have a process where everybody feels satisfied that that they have gained all all the all the information needed for them to submit a bid that they feel confident on so the PPPs also help us reduce and stabilize the turnover in the basic services. This is an issue that, that we have seen in Puerto Rico that has grown over the past couple of decades because we have not had a stable government. We had changes in government since the 90s. Every four years when there's there, there has been different governors, so different changes in, in public policy, different changes in, in personnel, different changes in administration, and all of that has really had an impact on, on the services that have been provided to the people of Puerto Rico because we don't really have that managerial co continuity in some of these services. So we were looking to, to really provide that stabilization to some of these services, and you will, we will see that as we move along. So, um, Let's talk about the projects that we have closed in the, in the la, last couple of years. The, the latest one or the one that was completed last year, in October of last year, is the transformation of the maritime transportation system. As I mentioned before, this is a service, an essential service that is is provided to the citizens of Puerto Rico, in particular to the citizens of the islands of, of Vieques and Culebra, which are two island municipalities that are part of Puerto Rico, but their only access or means of transportation to get to the bigger island is the ferry system. So because of what I mentioned before, the lack, the lack of continuity in, in the operation, in the managerial um, aspects of the, of, the, of the MTA, we needed to look for a private partner to stabilize a system that was really an essential service for the people of, of Vieques and Culebras. So we embarked on, on this P3 process that lasted over two years and ended up with the selection of a HMS ferries uh, as the selected proponent. We enter into the, the contract in October of, of 2020. We are now in the midst of the transition period, where they'll be taking over the different operations and bases of operations of, of the MTA. So this includes um, the fleet of, of the vessels, it in, includes a uh, maintenance facility, includes um, five, five di six different ports where, where they operate. So the two island municipalities, Ceiba and San Juan and Cataño, um, and the maintenance bay. It's a 23 year arrangement. We have a three year transition period and after the, those three years where MTA and HMS operate um, as, uh, as a full partner until the transition is completed, it, it really becomes a concession for the next 20 years where um, the, our, our partner really assumes most of the, of the risks of the operation based on, on, on a budget that will be finalized and agreed upon after that, that three year transition period. What we were looking for was that continuity. We wanted a safer service for the passengers and the crews. We, we really needed to improve the reliability and the quality of service. This is a, a service that really has failed the people of those islands co consistently over the years. And we needed to improve the maintenance of these vessels to make sure 
that we wouldn't really encounter the, the continuous problems that we have with those operations. So we wanted to modernize not only the, the fleet and the operations, but provide the, those crews and those employees with the, the continuous training and expertise that they needed to make sure that the, the service was adequate for all the, all the people on the islands. Um, so we've been almost on close to, to a year of, on, on the transition. Things are moving well. We, you know, there we've done inspections of vessels. We've done the inspections of the, of some of the sites, and and we continue moving forward. So the process is is going as expected and with the timeline that we were looking for. Um, the other big project that we also closed on last year was what we mentioned before was the transformation of PREPA's transmission and distribution system. PREPA is, is the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. To those of you that don't know, it, it was a, a vertic, vertically integrated, unregulated monopoly until about 2016 when there was an independent regulator figure that was established. Still, it was a, a vertically integrated monopoly until we completed this transaction. After the Hurricane Irma and Maria, Puerto Rico was 100% uh, without power for a number of days, but the average person in Puerto Rico was without power for more than 90 days. And we really didn't end up connecting the last, the, the citizens in, the, in what we call the last mile until over a year after the hurricane hit. So facing that reality after the hurricanes, the government of Puerto Rico made the decision that it had to transfer the operation of, of PREPA into private hands. And it was also determined that we needed to, to split that vertically integrated monopoly in, into different entities. So the first part of that transformation was looking for, for a private partner to manage and operate the transmission and distribution system, which is not only the heart of, of the operation, but also the part of the system that received the most of the damage after the hurricanes. It, it, this is an, an old system. It's, it's really a really fragile system. Um, it had not received the maintenance that it needed prior to the hurricanes. It is an entity that is under Title III of PROMESA, which would be the equivalent of being in bankruptcy court. It has a, over $9 million in, in, $9 billion in debt that are under under the jurisdiction of the Title III court and are being part is being part of a negotiation, but it's also key to understand that this is one of the largest public utilities in the United States, not only because of the amount of of, of customers it has, it has over 1.3 million customers, but because of the, the amount, the, the size and, and the amount of electricity it generates for all these customers. So this was a, a huge and complex transaction because it included the aspects related to the bankruptcy, but also because we needed to make sure that we could avail ourselves of all the federal funding that was available for the improvement of the system after um, the Hurricane Sirma Maria. So the way the contract was structured, it is an operation and maintenance agreement. It's a 15 year term agreement. The private partner is Luma Energy and Luma Energy Services. It is a consortium made up of ATCO and a Canadian company and Quanta, a US based company, both um, Fortune 100 companies with a lot, of, a lot of experience in the area. They have actually 
worked together in the past and they I, I, I built the, the largest transmission line in Canada as a, uh, as a P3. So they're very well known in the, they, they're familiar with the P3 market. They were familiar with the type of processes and, and it was a selection that we we're very proud of and confident that it will work out. So what's in their hands now, it's really the, the rebuilding and the reconstruction of the, of the system, making sure that, that we comply with all the requirements of the federal government and FEMA. Obviously, in the operational maintenance of the entire system, it, it includes the, the TND, includes customer service, it includes um, planning, environmental, legal, um, the financial department. So it's really, I would say 75% of what PREPA's operation was, it's included here. The remaining uh, part of the operation from PREPA is the generation side. So um, the other ones, which these are the projects that were done under my colleague, Javier Alvarez, Tenure as the P3 director, it's it's the 40-year concession of, of Metro P uh, uh, for highways PR22 and PR5. It's um, operated by Metro Pistas. It, it was a finance operate, rehabilitate, and maintain contract. It, it was a partnership originally from Abertiza Infrastructure and, Gold, and to Goldman Sachs infrastructure funds. The, the Goldman Sachs portion of it has been sold since. Metro Pistas remains the one that continues operating. It has been an, an excellent project, an award-winning project. It was extended to, uh, to 50 years. Um, and it really, with, with the airport that I'm gonna be talking about next, has become an emblematic project for, for the P3 program in Puerto Rico not only outside of Puerto Rico, but within Puerto Rico, people recognize the, the improvement and the difference that, that the Metro Pizza's operation has in, in, on, on those roads and, and I would say in the livelihood of the people that live in all those areas. So I think it has helped us facilitate our narrative to the people of Puerto Rico of what we're trying to do and hopefully the HMS and the Luma deals that I just mentioned will become part of those emblematic projects that, that will be the testimony of what we're doing here. The, the other project that, that we have is the airport, the Luis Munoz Marin International Airport. This was, it's, a, it's a 40 year concession. It was awarded to a consortium called now Arostar, it's a consortium of, of, of um, the, the, between High Star Capital and Grupo Aeroportuario del Sureste. And they are responsible for the operation and rehabilitation of the airport for, for the length of the contract. This is another project that has also shown or the, the results, not only in the improvements that they have done in, in infrastructure, which by now are over $200 million in improvements, but also in the increase in the amount of, of flights and offerings that we have, in the increase of passengers, or in the resiliency that the airport operation showed after Hurricanes Irma and Maria really becoming a lifeline for all of us, for not only for the people, but for bringing in the, the much needed help that, that was so critical during those um, months after, after the hurricane hit. So it, it is also, it's a, it's a great project. It's a, a, a great example and, and they, they are also great partners with all of us. So, I want to talk now about the ongoing projects and what we have really going on in our 
pipeline uh, as we speak. We we have a procurement for the modernization of the San Juan Bay cruise terminals. This is a project that is really similar in nature to to the Aerostar, the Luis Munoz Marine Airport, but with the, the cruise terminals. So we're looking for a private party, partner to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the operations of the San Juan passenger ports. So really we're the cruise terminals. So we, we're looking for somebody, for an entity to come in operate those terminals, make much needed improvements in infrastructure and repair those existing existing piers. Something that the Puerto Rico Ports Authorities, which is the partnering entity in this case, really is not in our fiscal situation to do and really has not been able to, to manage appropriately a, in the last couple of decades. So we we are now at the stage where we are negotiating with our preferred proponent. We, we have three qualified proponents, Puerto Rico Cruise Terminals, and one Cruise Terminal Partners, and our consortium with Global Ports Holdings. That is a project that we hope to, to complete at some point during this year. We, we also have an ongoing procurement with the Puerto Rico Aqueducts and Sewer Authority. This, this is a, an optim, optimization of, of the water consumption measure, measurement system and customer service. Really, we're looking here. Again, it's a design, build, finance, operating and, and, and management project, but it includes the installation, operation, and maintenance of, of smart meters to reduce the resources losses and that, that Praza is suffering continuously and has been for, for a lot of years. So we're looking to recapture, recapture that lost revenue that is out there that we know it's out there. And you know, Praza really was not in opposition at that time to, to do the investments that they needed, but we also need to improve the quality of the customer service uh, from the operations of Praza. So this is also a project where we have a preferred proponent that we're finalizing negotiations with. Oh, sorry. Another ongoing project that we have is, is the, what we call the Swan Life project at the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West Campus. This is a, again, a, a design build finance operation and, and management project to build student housing, parking, and, and additional improvements at the University of Maya West. The University of Maya West is, a, is really a, a, one of, a, of the bastions in the University of Puerto Rico's system. It, their, its engineering school is very well recognized, but the school actually does not have the proper housing facilities for not only for students, that are from Puerto Rico, but to attract students from outside Puerto Rico that would be wanting to, to join the system. So we're looking to, to change that by building an on-housing campus and trying to bring the, the host student center and, and improve the, the quality of, of the offerings at the University of Maya West. Here we also have a, a selected proponent that we are negotiating, negotiating with. We also have a public safety training center. This is one of the projects that came in to the P3 authority through the unsolicited proposal program that, that we offer. This is, again, is a, a design, build, finance, and operate a maintained um, project. It, it is to really consolidate the training, the public safety training for the Department of Public Safety and Corrections Department. So this would include um, firemen, police, correctional officers, and all, all really all those umbrellas that are between uh, under the Department of Public Safety. 
in Puerto Rico. We wanted to centralize that training. We wanted to, to provide uh, additional educational opportunities for those pros prospective and, and current um, employees of the department. And here we, we did an RFQ. We have not issued an RFP yet. We are in the process of, of doing the evaluation and moving forward. Um, we, we also have uh, the thermal generation facilities. This is really step two of, of the transformation of the electric sector. After the TMD, we started a process to look for a private operator or operators to take over what we what we call the legacy assets of, of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, which are the existing generation plant, plants that PREPA is operating. Most of these plants are, are older plants. Um, we have a public policy in, the, in Puerto Rico that we're gonna be moving to 100% renewable energy by 2050. We have a really aggressive renewable agenda. So this is a temporary O&M to operate these plants until the injection of renewables come into the system and those plants will be dismantled according to, to the integrated resource plan approved by the Puerto Rico Energy Board. We, we had a, a, we have a really competitive and robust group of, of, of entities participating. Um, so it's eight, eight different groups from, from all over the world actually that are looking in, into this process. We, we already did the shortlist, which is what, what we're seeing on, on the screen. And we, we moved to the RFP and uh, we have a goal of completing this transaction by the end of the year. So what do we have in, in our agenda for, for new projects that we are really starting as we speak? We, we have a project from the Department of Treasury. It's really a the modernization of the collection procedures and services that, that the Department of Treasury provides through their call centers. It's, it's you know, the, not only the capacity, but the modernization of the technology that's being used and, and really the efficiency of the system. We are looking to increase revenue, revenues uh, in, in the collections, but also generate savings and efficiencies through the operation management and maintenance of the call centers and the operating systems. We are at the initial stage in this project, working to, to determine its feasibility and I'm moving forward to prepare a desirability and convenience study based on, on what, what we find during the, this process. This project will allow the, the, for the rapid modernization of the processes and the capabilities of the Puerto Rico Structures Department, which is really leaving a lot of money out there because it doesn't lack, it, it lacks the capacity to handle uh, the, the processes. So it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be good for the taxpayers because it's gonna strengthen the educational programs that, that the, the tax, taxpayers are looking for when they call into, into for these services and improve obviously the, the entire operation for the Department of Treasury. Another project that we have with the Puerto Rico Ports Authority is, is what we're looking to do in, in, in I would say in phase three of, of the Ports Authority, phase one being the Luis Munoz Marine International Airport, phase two being the, the cruise ship terminals, and phase three will be to look for a private partner or partners to, to operate and maintain and really monetize the original airport network that, that the Ports Authority owns. It, it owns 
nine different regional airports with a variety of operations. Two of them are part part 139 airports. And, and three of them really are, are the, also provide transportation to the islands of Vieques and Culebra. We, we have the Seva Airport, which used to be a U, US Navy facility. It's a huge airport. We, so there's a lot of opportunity in, the, in this project. And, and we're also working on, on the desirability and convenience study for, for that project. We're also, we, we also have a project for the moderni modernization of the digital infrastructure of the Puerto Rico Highways and Transportation Authority. This is, is a project that we are just launching. We, we did an RFQ, RFP for advisors um, in the last couple of weeks to start analyzing the potential of, of doing a P3 with the Puerto Rico Highway and Transportation Authority to, to maximize the, some of its it existing digital infrastructure, but also to increase the opportunity to offer um, broadband and telecommunications and digital infrastructure throughout the, throughout the island using PRHTA's facilities. Another project that we're also commencing to evaluate is a public-private partnership for the redevelopment and rehabilitation of the Camuy River Cave Park. This is a, a, a park that's owned by the, the Department of Natural Resources and Environment. It's a 260-acre park and with over 220 explored caves. It's it's located in, in the northwestern side of, of the island, but it had been closed for a number of years until it recently reopened. Only a small part of the, of the park, it, it, is, it, is a, a, it is and ha, had been in the past a, a park that, that really led to a lot of economic development in that region and, and has been abandoned for a long time. We're looking for private partners to come in to try to help us rehabilitate that park and really provide the opportunities that we also think it, it has for that region. And I, that, that is the, the last of, of my, my slides. I think we can move to the Q&A. Gracias, Fermin. Thank you very much, Fermin. Very uh, outstanding presentation. I think there's a lot of opportunities. I can see a wide gap of uh, uh, ongoing and future projects. Uh, I really want to encourage everybody to uh, use the Q&A chat. Um, I will start with a couple of questions to, to get the ball rolling. And I'll, one I'll do in Spanish and one in English to make it fair to everybody. Sure. So I'll start with the English one. One of the things that caught my attention, Fermin, is that uh, how the P3 unit, that uh, you well mentioned that David, our good friend David Albers uh, started and now you're the leader, has really improved the way you, the way you promote projects. You know, you did mention that, and this is very common, and I'm trying to, uh, promote the use of Petri units all over the world. You know, we have a very uh, heavy Petri uh, unit developments and let's say in all South America and Mexico, we don't have a really formal one. It is residing in, in a couple of uh, quasi um, agencies and the United States is the same. You know, we do have the Build America Bureau, the good friend uh, Morteza there, but I think the Petri units help out with a strong um, pool of expertise, precisely because of the transitions of the governments. We want to have a super entity that really is a caretaker for water in Petries, <coughs> which can be uh, augmented with uh, consultants. So if you can explain a little bit more in detail how the Petri Puerto Rico unit is structured and how can we leverage that 
to use in other parts, of, I'm gonna say United States and Mexico as an example. What are the benefits of that, please? Okay, First question. So, so under Act, Act 29, and, I, and I'll go, thank you, thank you, Oscar, for the question. So I'll go into more details of, of how the program is structured under the Act and, and our regulation. By, by law, we have two ways for, for us to manage or, or, or handle a, a P3 project. One is what we call priority P3 projects, which are the, doing every, every calendar year in the first three months, we send out communications to, to the different branches of government, government and partnering entities, asking them if they have a particular service or need that they would like to address through, through a P, P3 process. And those type of projects that come in are, are projects that, that we select and, and we manage. The other way for projects to begin are through unsolicited proposals from private parties. We have um, under our law and our regulation, we, we have an unsolicited proposal process where part, private partners or potential private partners identify a need that they think they can um, perform or do better than, than the government is doing and that there is a potential. And we take on those projects. To give you examples, for example, the, the Praza project, it's a priority project. The regional airports is a priority project. The um, Puerto Rico maritime transportation is a priority project, but when we look at the cruise terminals, the um, public safety, those are projects that came in through unsolicited proposals. So that is a way for to allow the private market to participate in the process and, and really look for or identify areas where they think they can do they can do a better service for for Puerto Rico than, than we're currently doing or trying to improve that service through X or Y improvements. Um, in either way, once we, we get that, that project selected under our law, we have to do a desirability and convenience study, which is essentially a feasibility study of whether that proposed project is feasible and really in the public interest. For Puerto Rico, does the government of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico benefit from such a project? And, and is it really something that is worth addressing through a PPP project? Because not all projects are really meant to go through our process. Our process is a, a comprehensive, lengthy, and robust project. And sometimes project maybe, maybe are better handled through the partnering entity and through other procurement pro projects because they don't don't lack, lack they lack the complexity or the timeline does not adjust to their reality of what they're looking to do. So we do that evaluation here at the P3 Authority, and we move forward with the project from then. If we do come up with a feasibility study that that essentially tells us it is a good idea to to go forward with that project. Then under our law, we have to establish a partnering a partnership committee. The partnership committee is really the collegiate group that's going to be evaluating and 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 making all the decisions related to the project. So it's really like like the the what it will be like that like the the decision makers. And the, guy, and, and the team that will be gui guiding the process. So by law, our, our partnership committees are composed of, of the executive director of our fiscal agency, who's the chairman of the P3 board as well, the executive director or secretary of the partnering entity, a member of that entity's Board of Directors, 
and two other government employees that have experience or knowledge on the topic that's being discussed. So th those five, five persons are the ones that, that conduct the evaluation through the process by law. The way we manage the process is for each project, we, we hire three types of consultants. We hire a legal consultant, we, we hire a technical consultant, and we hire a financial consultant. We always look to our pool of advisors for, for consultants that have experience on those particular topics that we're, we're looking to address. So for example, if you look at our website, we just issued that, that um, request for, for consultants for the digital broadband infrastructure for the PRHTA. So that we're looking for people or entities that, that can serve as, a, as our consultants that have prior experience on P3s, well, on, on, that, on that area, broadband, highways, and, and that type of work. And with that, we go out, you know, we go out to the market um, with the project. We have we we try to maintain our visibility on on the different not only B three forums but infrastructure forums, and and make sure that our program is is well represented out there. To make sure that that the, the market markets know what we're doing and what we're looking for. And I think we have seen an increase in, in, in the, not only the quantity of, of parties interested in participating in our processes, but also um, on, on not, not only participants at, at the competitive level, but as consultants as well. So that's really how our, our pro, program is, is more or less. I, I, yeah. I really answer that. No, 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 actually, there's a, that that was the intent because there's a couple of questions in the chat related to that. Uh, one of the things I do want to mention that uh, uh, it, not everything can be a P3, obviously. You did yes. mention that it has to be uh, heavily scrutinized. Uh, there's a lot of in-depth analysis. There's a standard methodology that's um, you know promoted by uh, many multi- national organizations and, and there's also a model contracts you know I think it's important to not to reinvent the wheel to use very standard practice because that encourage uh, private participation worldwide you know for example just to give yeah. you an example one of the things I'm promoting in Mexico is the dispute review boards uh, yeah. that uh, are very helpful in managing disputes not only technical financial uh, even political. To have that uh, uh, part of the contract, and it's really uh, something that uh, the World Bank and many multi uh, multinational uh, are helping out. One of the distinguished things that I see in in, in U.S. framework and, and obviously Puerto Rico it is a quasi U.S. framework. Is um, the question is. Uh, does the Build America Bureau or, or the federal uh, US government have any uh, opportunities or they participate with any um, uh, maybe subordinate loans like a TFIA loan or, or maybe something to, to incentivize? Is that something that it is done in Puerto Rico? That's a question from my good friend, Philip Marquez. So no, no. he is asking that. So that, that is something that we, we are always trying to, to explore our, our law allows for it and we, and we could handle it and manage it if it, if, if it becomes available. Um, none of the projects that, that we have so far, we, ha we have used that as a the mechanism, but the opportunity is there. It's something that we have talked to, to the federal government about on several occasions. And and it may be available on a you know on a specific situation, um, but for example, when we talk about uh, the the transmission and distribution system, we we did incorporate in in the process um, the the opportunity or, or not the opportunity but but the need for the private partner to come in and manage all this 
FEMA funding that was available. So during the process, we had multiple discussions with, with federal government, government, with FEMA, with the Department of Housing, with Congress, with the White House, with everybody so that they were aware of what we were doing, what we were trying to do. We, you know, we, we did involve the bidders in conversations with, with FEMA and, and the federal authorities so that they knew that they were gonna be working hand in hand afterwards. And, and we continue to do so because now that Luma has taken over the system, we continue to, to, to work, not only us as administrators of the contract, but the Central Office for Recovery and Reconstruction of the Government of Puerto Rico, who's the recipient of these funds, and FEMA work together in, in with Luma to make sure that, that these projects move forward accordingly. So um, that it, it is available. We, we you know we we always explore it and and okay. it, it is something that we are, are trying to do when the when uh, the right project comes in. Yeah, we've been uh, reaching out to Mortesa, the Above American Bureau, precisely to encourage uh, uh, how the states in the United States can benefit from having P3 units more formalized. Uh, it's not uncommon. The only disadvantage, as you all know, the, the United States uh, has a very large municipal bond market. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily they want to do a P3 model. They have access to uh, cheaper money yeah. sometimes in the private sector to the municipal bond bond. Is that something that Puerto Rico also has access to municipal bonds that, uh, or, or is it mainly or for a P3 uh, situation? No, actually, I mean, we did at some point, <laughs> but because of our current fiscal situation, yeah. you know, the, the, we, we're just, you know, trying to get out, out of the bankruptcy, trying to, to finalize a plan of adjustment through, through PROMESA. Um, for ex the, the Puerto Rico Aquatics Authority does, it, it ha has been an example and they've just closed some refinancing of their bonds and, and their debt. So um, eventually that's what we aim to do. For example, with, with part of the, the structure that was established for the TND for the OM in, in PREPA was really allowing for the Puerto Rico government through PREPA once they exit bankruptcy to have the facility or the opportunity in the future to go out in the market and issue bonds once they, they have settled their, their bankruptcy. So it, it is something that, that we're working our ways, our way out of so that we can have that access to the markets, but I think we're, we're on a path, on the right path to, yeah. to get there. I think um, a lot of states, uh, the union are, are coming to the threshold of their bonding capacity. So that's why we're trying to promote a very good uh, approach to HP trees, obviously it's an alternative. Um, I have a question here from, um, Guajida, sorry, I apologize if I don't mention your name correctly. Guajida Benju. Uh, it says, how does the international and foreign private players are welcome in participating in P PP3 units in Puerto Rico? So they, they they are certainly welcome if you look at our uh, at our trajectory. Um Ida Star, it's it's actually uh, uh, from from, from Mexico and I think Metropistas is a Spanish uh, is a Spanish entity, Albertis and and Luma is a Canadian uh, a partner in the in the consortium. So I would say three three out of the four are mainly international players and and when we look at our procurements that we have, we have a lot of international players not not only uh, participating but they always show a lot of interest. So. It, it is welcome. We are really looking forward to to the best the best partners out there from our, from wherever they are. And uh, it, it is it, it is a transparent competitive project, and and we you know we do welcome everybody, and and I think our track record shows it. <laughs> for and sure. That's the beauty of having a well-established Petri unit, where you have a strong regulatory framework already in law. 
and you have yes. a pool of expertise and you augment yourself with consultants, you have a very transparent tending process. So all that is very important. Uh, uh, I do, you did mention Mexico and, and other countries. I, I wanna say a uh, shout out good friend, uh, Orlando Olmedo, he's there from Mexico. Shout out to wow. him also. I have another friend uh, from Canada, Hani Hawad is joining us here. So Hani, to see you here. And also Mr. Jack right. Lacken, another good players. They're all uh, big international uh, uh, consultants in the area. So happy to have them here with us. Uh, I'm going to make a question now in Spanish <clears throat> for everybody's benefit. Uh, la pregunta es la siguiente. Este, mencionaste, Fermín, que el prepa es, tenía una, una propuesta para el mantenimiento de la operación de lo que viene siendo todo el sistema de, de abastecimiento de electricidad, eh, el legacy, ¿no? De, sí. Hay una transición a las energías renovables y eso es importante porque obviamente que hay unos lineamientos de los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable. Claro. La sustentabilidad es importantísima. El que no está haciendo infraestructura sustentable, pues yo no sé qué está haciendo. Y, y mencionaste también el, el componente de la resiliencia y el componente de que tiene que haber un beneficio para las personas. Todas esas tres guías es algo que en WAP estamos tratando de impulsar, que, que sean proyectos sustentables en todo el sentido de la palabra, ¿eh? no más técnicamente, sino inclusive eh, económicamente, ¿no? Este, sí. cómo se maneja. Y, y una de las una de las oportunidades que podrían presentarse son en las, y, y eso es muy común o sea, de México y Latinoamérica, de las propuestas no solicitadas, ¿no? No son solo esos propósitos. Creo que hay una avenida de oportunidad en las energías renovables. También hay sí. una gran oportunidad en los residuos sólidos que se pueden convertir en energía y también aliviar un problema de, de saneamiento. Obviamente que lo que mencionas de broadband y de toda la interconectividad del internet, que pues ya es, una, es un, requisito, un requisito ya con esta pandemia, hemos ha puesto en manifiesto la necesidad de tener esa accesibilidad para todo, la educación para la economía. Claro. Pero también quisiera yo preguntarte sobre esas, sobre las que son las propuestas no solicitadas, cómo las ven ahí en Puerto Rico, eh, no necesariamente tienen que ser grandes proyectos, pudieran ser proyectos de menor escala. Y luego también el componente de infraestructura social, ¿no? Si hay alguna cuestión, en la cuestión de salud, que con el COVID, obviamente, el acceso a la salud, healthcare, si pudieras elaborar un poquito, si hay algunas cuestiones ahí que se pueden visualizar con estando solicitadas. Mira, eh, ahora mismo... Eh... Tenemos algunos de los proyectos que han venido por, 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 por propuestas no solicitadas. Es un proceso que, que a nosotros nos gusta. Eh, entendemos que ha sido positivo eh, ¿verdad? Para, para el programa. Esa oportunidad, como les mencioné, el, el de puertos de crucero es uno que llegó, por ejemplo, como una propuesta no solicitada. Nosotros eh, eh, nos ayuda un poco, ¿verdad? Porque... Nosotros no tenemos necesariamente todo, el, todo el, el, ¿verdad? el tiempo y la capacidad para estar evaluando todas las posibilidades de P3 que hay allá afuera en, en, ¿verdad? en el gobierno de Puerto Rico y las personas que son los expertos en el área, que saben hacerlo y lo han hecho en otros lugares, pueden identificar a lo mejor ese servicio o ese recurso más, más rápido que nosotros porque lo han visto en otro país, en, otro, ¿verdad? en, en otros gobiernos cómo se opera a través de una, de una alianza público-privada, dicen, esto puede funcionar en Puerto Rico y aquí está la, la receta. Y nosotros lo vemos y si entendemos, oye, esto es bueno, lo, lo consultamos con la entidad participante y si ellos dicen, se ve, ¿verdad? Esto tiene un potencial, es interesante, vamos a, vamos a estudiarlo, entonces lo manejamos. Ahora mismo, honestamente, no tenemos nada en el área de salud que esté en nuestra en nuestra cancha, ni ningún proyecto prioritario que se esté moviendo. Sí sabemos que, que eso sería, eh, ¿verdad?, un área importante que podíamos explorar, eh, de, 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 ¿verdad?, eh, para Puerto Rico. 
eh, en el área de, de educación, creo que también serían proyectos buenos, ¿verdad? De esta infraestructura social que yo creo que es importante, que también podríamos eh, explorar y no, y no tenemos, fuera del de Mayagüez, no tenemos ningún otro proyecto así grande. Pero, pero no, nos ha funcionado el proceso y, y hemos corrido proyectos basados en eso y, ¿verdad? Prontamente esperamos cerrar algunos de ellos para entonces poder también tener eso en nuestra, en nuestra trayectoria de que sí hemos podido llevar un proyecto que viene por una propuesta no solicitada y, y se completa. Sí, creo que pues hay una gama de oportunidades. Ahorita lo acabas de mencionar. No hay nada del sector salud. Puede ser una gran oportunidad. Sí. Eh, definitivamente las energías. Eh, la, la pregunta era si, si la ley de APPs o reglamentación premia esas iniciativas. Yo creo que en México, okay. voy a hablar de México, sí las hay. Y eso ayuda también a, a promover tecnologías nuevas, ¿no? La innovación, que es importante. Por eso la pregunta es si la ley te, te da unos puntos. En un momento dado tú corres el riesgo de una propuesta no solicitada. Sí. Y llega un momento que a lo mejor, pues en, ya cuando se licita, te dan ciertos puntos que te permita mantener ese liderazgo, ¿no? Sí. sí. O puedes vender hasta el proyecto, ¿no? Yo creo que es algo. Tiene, sí, sí, la ley y el reglamento le permiten al comité de alianza darle ciertas ventajas al proponente que presenta la, la propuesta no solicitada. Y la realidad es que también, pues yo siempre digo, la ventaja de ser el que origina el proyecto, pues te da también una ventaja en términos de conocimiento automáticamente. O sea que, pero la ley lo provee, el reglamento lo provee y así lo hemos manejado en la práctica también. O sea, que sí hay, hay unas ventajas que se, que se identifican. Y definitivamente creo que esa es una gran oportunidad de, que hay que impulsar. La cre Lo estoy haciendo ya acá con los ingenieros de México, inclusive tengo yo sí. una propuesta de crear. Es, tenemos 60 colegios acá y soy el chairman de P3 en la federación y vamos a crear mini unidades en toda la República Mexicana Tremendo. para promover la, la creatividad o sea, dar un diagnóstico dar un diagnóstico de, 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 dar un diagnóstico situacional y luego ya irlo escalando ¿no? pues este, claro. tenemos ya un, un convenio con WAP inclusive en la federación entonces creo que es ganar ganar es ponerse todos a a pensar como desarrolladores, estoy hablando de los ingenieros, sí. obviamente, desarrolladores, ¿no? Y pues tenemos una gama, una oportunidad, creo que Puerto Rico es un poster child, eh, me da mucho gusto que sí, los funciona. hermanos de Puerto Rico estén promoviendo, y eso puede ayudar a Estados Unidos, inclusive, como un ejemplo de tener buenas unidades de P3. Creo que estamos ya a punto de, de terminar. Eh, déjame ver si hay otra pregunta por ahí. De lo contrario, oh, una pregunta adicional. Este, en la cuestión de abastecimiento de agua, eh, tengo yo interés ahí. Eh, ¿Cómo está resolviendo su problemática Puerto Rico de, en, en la cuestión del agua, que es un gran tema? ¿Está orientado hacia las plantas desaladoras, al reuso? ¿Hay algo por ahí, ahí que se pueda promover a través de un Petri? Mira, a, ahora mismo, ¿verdad? Uno, un, lo que buscábamos con el proyecto que estamos corriendo es, es, es atender la pérdida de agua que tiene el sistema. O sea, hay mucha agua que entra al sistema y se pierde, eh, ¿verdad? Y no... no no, ni se utiliza, ni se, ni, ni, ni se factura, ni llega a los clientes. O sea que esa instalación de, de los metros inteligentes lo que busca es identificar en dónde hay que hacer esas mejoras de infraestructura porque se está perdiendo el agua en este sistema y tratar de recapturar todas esas pérdidas en, en verdad, con más velocidad y más, y más detalle. En términos de, de la captación de agua, Casualmente, aunque esto no, no suena medio extraño un poco, pero es la Autoridad de Energía Eléctrica la que es la dueña de la mayoría de los embalses de agua en Puerto Rico y con, con contratos con la Autoridad de Acueductos y verdad entre esa relación se lo pasa. ¿Por qué? Porque originalmente esos embalses se hicieron para las hidroeléctricas. Eh. 
Claro. Porque esa, la Autoridad de Energía Eléctrica empezó como la Autoridad de Fuentes Fluviales y la mayoría de la generación eléctrica era por las hidroeléctricas. Después entonces cuando se cambia a, ¿verdad? a combustibles fósiles y a, y a generación termal, pues esas esa hidroeléctricas eh, son bien pequeñas y ya no dan mucha función, pero los embalses son propiedad de la Autoridad de Energía Eléctrica. Esos embalses eh, son parte de los proyectos de la Autoridad de Energía Eléctrica que se van a estar eh, mejorando, dragando para darle más capta, mejor captación y ¿verdad? ayudar a la Autoridad de Acueductos a, con ese problema de, de, ¿verdad? de el recurso tan importante que es el agua. Pero ahora mismo no, no se está, no, no, por lo menos que yo conozca, ¿verdad? No hay ningún proyecto de, de sanización ni nada. Eh, ah, pues eso es otra, otra avenida de oportunidad. Este, también. El tema también. del agua es fundamental. Estamos aquí viendo en Yo México, en sí. toda la parte del norte de México y el sur de Estados Unidos. Sí. Bueno, pues estamos a punto de terminar. Quisiera, aquí hay un pequeño comercial. Tengo a mi amigo a Hani Awad que nos invita al Petri Council Conference a celebrarse el 16 al 18 de noviembre. We will have an event. The Canada Petri World Council. Here's my good friend Wayne Collins from Canada. And uh, I really encourage everybody to attend. It's going to be held uh, 16 to the 18th. So plugs for that. This, um, like I said, this uh, webinar is being recorded. They will continue for perpetuity in YouTube and many channels. I'm very happy to have you part of the WAP community, Fermin, with the Petri unit. And also this, uh, if, if it's okay with you, the presentations we can share. We, yes. I can share, uh, whoever is interested in, in the presentation, please uh, send me, uh, send Wayne or me or Larry uh, an email, we'll be happy to share. We have it both in English and Spanish. So yes. I think the opportunity is there. Any final thoughts for me before we log out? No, thank you very much for the for the opportunity. Um, I think it's great to have these conversations with with, pe with people that are interested in in the same topics as we as, as we are, and and we, you know we're here to to help. We are here to to discuss this, and we love sharing our, our experiences with everybody and any other programs that would like to talk to us. We're always available to share our, our input and and we're here for everybody. So thank you. Thank you, WAP, for the opportunity. And we look forward to continuing to work together with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. I'll see you in the next WAP webinar. Thank you, Wayne, for all your help. Take thank care you. and stay safe, please. Take care.